Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I want to say to the chief sponsors, Representative Katie Stewart and Senator Andy Menar, thank you. Thank you for championing our classrooms and getting this bill across the finish line. Our schools will be stronger because of the work that you've done. Uh, to all the bill co-sponsors who are here, including the 96th district's own Representative Sue Scherer, Thank you for adding your voices. I also want to thank the parents and the teachers and the advocates for their hard work making this day happen. As Illinois' children head back to school this week and next, this new law says to them and to their parents loud and clear, we value teachers. As Illinois' children also are thinking about their education. They will have more teachers in their classrooms. They will be in classrooms with fewer people in them. They will learn better. They will do better. For many years, even before I became governor, I've worked to support education, whether that's through advocacy for early learning programs or expanding school breakfast for low-income students, and as governor, I was very proud to propose, negotiate, and sign a bipartisan budget this year, which makes historic investments in our education system from cradle to career. To succeed in improving our education system and overcoming years of neglect, we must make sure that we have great teachers in our classrooms, in every classroom. But as everyone in this room knows, Illinois faces a dire shortage of teachers and paraprofessionals at every grade level all across our state. Last school year, over 4,000 jobs in schools, including nearly 1,500 teaching positions, went unfilled statewide. 27 of those open positions were right here in Sangamon County. The students of Springfield District 186 were missing both a health and a science educator. In Rochester, it was a social worker. In Riverton, a special education teacher. Every district in this state has these issues. These are the people who serve as the entry point for our kids to learn about the world. It's on all of us to show them that we value them and that we want them to be able to earn a good living in their communities. 
That work starts with taking a hard look at the salaries being offered to our teachers and making sure that they're competitive in today's job market. Right now, our statutory annual minimum for teachers is $10,000, established many years ago. That outdated baseline allows many positions, particularly in rural communities, to be shortchanged. And when we're missing out on quality, dedicated educators who can't afford to take these jobs, it's our kids who pay the price. In signing this legislation, we're addressing our teacher shortage and gradually putting teachers on track to make at least $40,000 a year by the first day of school in 2023. We put forward historic levels of funding for education in FY20. And together with this bill that I'm signing today, we're helping put teachers and paraprofessionals into our state's most challenged districts. Last year, Governor Rauner vetoed this legislation, telling families in our state that it's okay to let children try to learn in overcrowded classrooms with underpaid teachers. But this year is different, and our message is quite different. Our future starts in our schools, and the choices that we make about our schools will determine the quality of that future. To teachers in this room and all across our state, I see the hard-earned dollars that you pull from your own pockets to provide school supplies in your classrooms. And I see the after-school hours that you spend with students who need a little extra help. I see you making sure a few of the poorest students in your class don't go hungry and that they feel valued. And I see you and the care and compassion that you put into your work, and I'm proud to help make sure that you earn what you're worth. Now I'd like to introduce one of the bill's chief co-sponsors and someone who has truly become a leader here in Springfield at, from Southern Illinois, a friend of mine, Representative Katie Stewart. Yep, there you are. Thank you, and thank you all for coming today. Um, Governor, I have to say this is not the first uh, bill signing that I've attended with you, uh, and I have to say thank you. Um, it's so nice to have someone in this office who gets it, who understands that those adults in the room with those children are the most important piece of that education puzzle. Uh, I had a, a long 20 plus year career in classrooms, everywhere from middle school uh, all the way through university teaching mathematics. Uh, and I get frustrated being told all the time, teachers are important, teachers are important, they're so important, I value my kids' teachers. But when it came down to making sure that those teachers in the room can afford to do that job, that's where we frequently fell short. So I was so happy to sponsor this legislation. I was happy to uh, be a co-sponsor of it last time and disappointed in the veto uh, by Governor Rauner. Uh, it was a no-brainer to, to bring it back because I knew that we would have the support uh, in our champion, um, Governor Pritzker. Um, I, I think this is vitally important. In addition to being in front of the classroom, I also work to train our student teachers. So those young people going to our universities uh, with the intention of becoming mathematics educators in the future. And our numbers at SIU Edwardsville and across the state were dwindling. And it's impossible to not realize a lot of that is due to the salaries. They look at this career that they've wanted to do for their whole lives. They grew up knowing they wanted to be an educator, and they, the reality of it was it was not going to be affordable. I knew children, uh, well, they were actually adults, but I still think of them as children, uh, who were, uh, have parents that, have, that were educators, and that's what they really wanted their children to do, but they had long discussions, and they ended up actually encouraging their children to follow a different path, uh, and they were really disappointed to do that. So this, like I said, this legislation was so important to me. Um, I think it shows that we value teachers here in the state of Illinois. We want you to come to the state of Illinois, stay in the state of Illinois, and teach our young people. And we're going to make sure that you understand that that is one of our top priorities. So again, I have to say thank you to uh, Governor Pritzker for supporting this and signing this legislation today. Um, it's my honor now I get to introduce um, the president of my union, the IEA, uh, Kathy Griffin. Thank you. 
The $40,000 40, minimum salary legislation sends a message to teachers and future teachers. It says you are valued and you are respected if you teach in the state of Illinois. This step is critical as we face a growing teacher shortage. It will allow us to attract and retain the best teachers for our children. One, on behalf of 135,000 members of the Illinois Education Association and their students, I would like to thank Governor Pritzker and the Illinois General Assembly for their leadership. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Jen White with the IFT. During my 18 years in the classroom, I've seen a growing number of our new teachers struggle to make ends meet on their starting salary. Many of them are crippled by student loan debt and the rising costs of health insurance. Add on top of this, the cost of setting up new classrooms, providing supplies for their students, and paying to continue their own education, many young teachers fall below the federal poverty level and resort to getting a second job. Teacher shortage is now at a crisis level. Champaign started school last week, and there are still almost 30 positions left unfilled, with a third of those being in service of our ESL and special education students. Hopefully, this legislation will help us better serve our students and improve educational opportunities and outcomes for all. Thank you. I'd like to welcome Superintendent Dan Cox. Good morning. I'm Dan Cox, Superintendent of Staunton Schools. The greatest factor in student learning is, that our, is our teachers. And the greatest factor in student learning is our teachers, and investing in them is an investment in our students. At a time when teacher shortage is at a crisis, this bill will help restore value to the profession. In doing so, school districts will have the ability to attract and retain the best and the brightest teachers. I want to thank Governor Pritzker, Senator Menar, Representative Stewart, and everyone involved for placing a high priority on education and for also helping make this bill become a reality. It's now my pleasure to introduce Ms. Bentley Stewart. Good morning. My name is Bentley Stewart and I'm a second year teacher at Crossroads Learning Center, Jacksonville School District 117. Thank you, Governor Pritzker, for signing this bill. I currently make about 34,000 this year and this bill is great news for us and other current and future teachers. By passing this law, you have told us that we are valued. Educators go into the teaching profession because we're passionate about it. I personally teach K through 12 expelled and suspended kids. I make connections with these students every day. I deeply care about them and I want them to succeed. It's a very hard job and teachers don't mind that, but we also wanna be secure in knowing we'll be able to raise our own families and that our families will be secure. And this law goes a long way towards that. While I was in college, many of my favorite teachers back home were discouraging me from finishing my education degree because of the low pay and the student debt. Many of them picked up extra jobs that kept them away from their own families. I persevered, but I did have to move back home with my parents and picked up another job as I began teaching uh, to supplement the pay and to manage my student loan debt that is very high. This new law will allow future teachers to begin the pr profession with that confidence they need. I grew up in Jacksonville and I graduated from Jacksonville High School. And after college, I came back to Jacksonville to teach and to raise my own family. This law gives me hope. It shows me that Illinoisans respect educators and the work that we do for our students and our own communities. Thank you. Back to Well, you heard me talk about the fact that we did a good job in our budget of funding schools, that we in fact put in the, not only the required amount for the evidence-based funding model, but we actually went over and above that. And it's very important that we continue on that path. And as a result of that, we will be able to make sure that we're funding in those school districts where this $40,000 uh, minimum will be effective over the next 20, uh, sorry, until 2023. Um, the funding of the evidence-based funding model will take care of the issues or, or challenges that may exist. Thank you. <laughs> Greg. 
school boards have with teachers and teachers' unions, what else should they be worried that the state might take away from their negotiating well, Greg, remember that we have a teacher shortage in this state, and because the state has really not stepped up to its obligation to fund schools, let me remind everybody that we are second to last in the nation in state funding for education. That may surprise some people, but second to last in the nation in state funding for education. Um, that's one of the reasons, you know, the, the school districts have been challenged to pay people. If the state will step up to the plate, um, we can make sure the teachers get paid properly. This is just one step on the road to making sure that we've got great teachers, that we've got enough teachers, uh, that we've got schools that people want to go to. Uh, so I'm very proud of this, and I think that the school districts will be able to manage it as a result of state funding. Uh, you may recall that there was almost $500 million total funding that went to K-12 education, uh, an increase of $500 uh, million this year, in this fiscal year. I think it's exactly the opposite. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I mean, it's exa exactly the opposite. If the state will step up to the plate, one of the reasons that we have high property taxes in our state is because we're second to last in state funding. So where does the burden fall? It falls on local property taxpayers in Illinois. If we were just average in the United States, about half the money would come from the state and half the money would come from local property taxes. And we should begin to move off of second to last and begin to get, you know, move ourselves toward uh, a place where we're alleviating property taxes by paying for schools more from the state level. Is there an estimate, governor, but you know, the fact remains, at least as of right now, property taxes are kicking in a majority for uh, school funding. Is there an Well, again, let me remind you what we did in the spring session of the legislature. First, almost $500 million more for K-12 education, and remember, that's the vast majority of what people are paying for in their local property tax bill. Second, we passed a massive uh, capital bill uh, that also sends funds, $650 million across the state to local governments, again, Another thing that people are, have been typically paying for from property taxes is infrastructure. These are infrastructure funds that can be spent at the local level that therefore could alleviate local property taxes. So actually we're doing, I think, a good job of trying to address the pressure that's been there on local property taxes by having the state step up to the plate in areas where it should. Is there any estimate of total cost of this, like by 2023, you know, differences between what's been paid now and then? Um, there's not, there's a, there are about, uh, uh, as I understand it, there are about 8,000 positions that would be affected, but again, over the entire course of this, you know, uh, four-year endeavor to increase uh, minimum teacher pay. So that's out of 100 and somebody remind me, 100 and how many thousand teachers are there, Kathy? Well, for IEA, 135,000, and IFT has about 100. Okay, so 230, so it's... And are only 8,000 making less than 40 now? Or? It's, as I understand, at least I, I, I have read that number, so I think it's 8,000. If, if That's a number I have read, so it may be more than that. Is it going to take longer for some of the districts to get the adequacy uh, as the payroll goes up? Well, um, many of the districts that will benefit here are, in fact, the, district, the, the districts that benefit from EBF, from evidence-based funding are in fact the, many of the districts where people are get, getting paid under $40,000. Um, so if you're asking, you know, who's benefiting here, it, it is in fact districts that need it most. So will it take longer to get that, to get that Not if we continue to do what I intend to do, which is to make sure that we're improving our state commitment to K-12 education. Just want to make sure if there's anything, uh, anybody else on the topic of minimum teacher pay or education. Does this move the adequacy mark further out? Now it costs more to provide an adequate education to the $40,000 minimum wage. Again, this is a minor, minor part of what needs to be done in schools uh, across the board. So when you talk about the adequacy mark, um, you know, we're talking about this is, 
a, a major improvement, but when you look at the list of things that need to be done and the cost of those, this is a pretty minor endeavor. Um, yesterday you said that it depends on what manager you knew about bullying, um, uh, with mates involved. Have you talked to uh, the speaker, if so, what was that conversation like, and did you ask him what yeah. did you know? Yeah, I have expressed my uh, deep concern. Um, and the fact that this is unacceptable in state government, um, in the capital, um, uh, he knows where I stand on this. Um, uh, you know, I also have taken my own steps within our administration uh, across all the agencies as well as in the governor's office itself to make sure that we have the kinds of policies and procedures that protect people who might get harassed or, uh, or worse, uh, to make sure that they feel uh, uh, that that you know they can come forward, no retribution. That we're going to protect them in the process, and that we'll ultimately have independent investigations wherever uh, we need them to make sure that people's allegations are completely heard. And then, as I said yesterday, transparency is critically important. Once we know that people need to be held accountable, uh, and there's information that that ultimately, as a result, should be shared, we want to make sure that it's transparent. So let me remind you that the initial uh, license holders for adult use cannabis are the very same ones that are abiding by very strict rules under the medical cannabis legislation and licensing rules. So they are, you know, they start out uh, prepared. Um, having said that, there are certainly new rules uh, that will be applied to them, but when you think about all that they've had to abide by in order to make this medical cannabis program work, and it really has worked, um, that they are the best prepared. So that gives us additional time um, as we look at you know, additional licensees to make sure that everything will work properly when we bring in people who haven't uh, been in the medical licensed program. Um, so I'm, I'm, I feel good about it. The IDFPR is doing a terrific job. We have multiple agencies that are on top of this. We have a team that's focused on these rules. So I, I think we're going to get there. And I think, again, in this case, um, the thing that makes it a, a, a little bit easier, I guess, because, you know, again, you're right, it's a de novo set of regulations that we're going to be putting forward for uh, adult use cannabis but it makes it a little easier that we've got the, the licensees are already abiding by a fairly strict set of rules. Can we get your, well, thoughts, on, can we get your thoughts on um, putting all the new security for two residential people's house, the mansion? And as long as it's the last question, if there's any changes you'd like to make in the state fair next year, having spent so much time there this year. That's two. <laughs> well, that's two <laughs> questions. So, uh, so you're saying last two questions. Yeah. Um, um, uh, okay, let's uh, let's start with the uh, uh, with security. the security issue. Um, uh, first of all, you know uh, these were recommendations uh, that were put forward uh, to make sure from the state police that were to make sure that this is a secure uh, facility. Uh, you know that many many other states that have governors' mansions uh, have uh, security protocols that are much stricter than the ones that we had here in Springfield. So, um, so I understand, you know, why this is something that's necessary. Um, you know, what I want most of all is for people to be able to, uh, uh visit the governor's mansion to see, um, you know, the, really it's an amazing governor's mansion. I think it's one of the largest in the nation. Um, it has, uh, you know, really beautiful interiors, people who have not been through it, I want to encourage you all to go. Um, and there are even more improvements that are kind of slowly being implemented. Um, but I think these are the right things to do. And, and again, we're trying to follow the recommendations of professionals. Uh, as to the State Fair, I was uh, thrilled to be at the State Fair virtually every day of the fair. And it was, I think, one of the most successful in recent memory, certainly. We broke records uh, in grandstand ticket sales and grandstand revenue. Um, they're going to be coming out, I guess, with the numbers of attendees, uh, which, according to vendors, just on an anecdotal basis, um, our team heard from vendors that it was one of the best years that they can remember uh, for them. So I, it, was a, it was a great year and I'm, I'm really thrilled. I want our state fairs to be uh, top notch and to be hugely successful. They are economic engines 
for the areas in which they reside. Um, and I'm excited to go to DuCoin shortly, um, where I hope that we'll have another uh, terrific fair and where that is also critically important as an economic engine for the um, southern Illinois area. So thank, thank you. you.